So. Uh, All right, we're, we're recording. I'm going to make Lynn host. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'd like to uh, call the finance committee meeting of December 8, 2020 to order uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, general law, chapter 38, section 18. This meeting of the finance committee is being conducted via remote participation. And um, so we'll go around to each of the committee members and just make sure that everybody um, is uh, able to hear and we can hear them just by saying the word present as I say your name. Um, I'll start with Bob Hegner. Present. And uh, Lynn. Present. Uh, Dorothy. Present. And Kathy. Present. Bernie. Present. And Pat. Present. Okay, I think that we um, are all here and ready to go. And um, uh, Luna's uh, volunteered to manage the screen when we need documents on the screen. And maybe we should put up the agenda um, quickly and uh, just um, see if everybody's agree um, has any comments on the agenda and then uh, we'll proceed. And uh, I think we know what the major items are for today's discussion. Um, How are they going to get to it? Two seconds. Put the agenda. It's not a... It's in the pot. Here we go. Okay, thank you. So, um, this is what the agenda is. Um, the item number three the regional school budget and assessment method follow up to Fort Towns meeting. We may want to talk about that as we go through the um, draft budget guidelines and get to the section where the regional school budget is uh, recommended. Um, item number four is, can be stricken from the um, agenda because we did not receive a um, referral proposal. Uh, there is one topic that was unanticipated, which is the last item, which is really just a report of something additional that was referred to the committee that I'll make um, at the end. I think that all of the counselors know, know about it, but um, uh, just to make sure that the uh, two resident members who are not present are aware of it. Um, so, and uh, I think that the only other thing that um, I will mention just as the introductory piece is that I had sent everybody um, the copy of the criteria that the GOL is planning to use um, in the uh, selection of somebody to replace Sharon, which has been the same criteria that has been previously used. Um, if there are comments on it, you certainly are welcome to send them to me or as a member of GOL to, or to GOL directly through its chair, George Ryan. Um, but um, I did not put that down as an agenda item because um, it's really not a committee action of our committee and uh, that actually arose from a discussion in prior committee uh, some when it was first drafted uh, many years ago, it seems actually only probably two. So let's turn to the uh, budget guidelines if everybody's agreeable, unless somebody has an initial uh, statement that they'd like to make. And uh, Dorothy Pam, I know, has a uh, question about scheduling of future meetings, and uh, uh, that we'll we'll get to it at the appropriate agenda item. So uh, I think that what I would propose to do is to see if there are any general comments about 
the way that the uh, whole, the document, the draft three of the um, guidelines is presently. And then um, from there, I was going to try and go through sort of section by section, not take it all at once, but uh, to uh, hit upon first the uh, philosophy, then each, each major section going down. So um, let me get to my participant list so that I can make sure. Kathy, I see your hand up. Yeah, it, um, it's, it's a comment that I think I've made in the past and it's because of the way I read documents like this. I think we should have an appendix A that's the table that Sean and staff put into the um, financial indicators that showed FY20, FY21, FY22, or if, um, because I, while it's useful and we're, we're referring to this went up, this went down, we were lucky this stayed steady. I think um, having people not have to go find the other document and it's, it's as my memory is, it's, it's two pages long. So it wouldn't bulk this up very much and it would just put it in all yeah. one place. Um, actually, you've raised that previously and thank you very much. It was uh, because you had mentioned it to me a week or more ago. And I did actually uh, ask Sean about that, whether when it gets to the final version uh, that's going to the council and we've finished with this draft, whether we can add the tables and uh, that were from the financial indicator report. And uh, Sean can, will jump in and see if I'm not quoting him correctly, but I think that what he said was no problem. Yeah. yeah. And I totally expected it would only be in the final version. So thanks, Sean. Yeah. But thank you for so that everybody else is aware of the fact that you made the request. Um, so I think that takes care of that. So um, I want to go through just each section and see if, um, first of all, whether there's questions or comments about the overall philosophy and concerns for FY22 section. And then I'm gonna ask uh, questions about specific pieces of it, um, just through going through it in order. But I'll start with the general question and look to see if there's anybody who has any comments. Um, seeing no hands yet, um, is there any um, in the third paragraph on, well, actually the first paragraph on page two, um, we adopt the level funding um, piece, uh, which was part of the recommendation from the town manager at the financial indicators meeting. And it was what all those tables are built upon. Um, and uh, so we should make sure that um, we're comfortable with level funding and that may, this actually gets into the school discussion in a minute, uh, but Dorothy, you have your hand up and you're muted. On a uh, small item on page two, <clears throat> you said, um, I think it's page two, one or two, where is it? <laughs> Somewhere where you mentioned possibility of one or two, oh, it's on page three, uh, debt exclusion overrides. And I guess I thought we'd had a lot of conversation on this and had come to an understanding that one was the maximum that it made sense to ask for and that we should not be juggling. I mean, the more pieces we juggle, the longer, harder it is and the longer it is before a decision is made. And um, we're getting to the point where we have to make some decisions. I, so I, I, I hate how, including that possibility of two because I haven't talked to anybody that thinks that, that two would pass. I mean, this is all guessing of course, but it's, that's what we do. We, we talk to people and we keep our ear open. Um, 
Okay, since you've raised the issue, I think we should just go ahead and uh, um, talk about that. Um, I guess the reason that I put it in in the way that it word and we did have that discussion is that ultimately the decision will be made by the council and the council will have to vote each time as to whether it's going to uh, have an override. But uh, if you, uh, uh, what is the sense of the committee as to whether it should be uh, given that the council may need to ask uh, to approve A or one as opposed to one or two? Andy, just to mention, Lynn? remember, I can't raise my hand, so I have to be obnoxious and wave. Yeah, I saw you. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, no, I saw you. Uh, I'm in favor of saying a debt exclusion override for two reasons. First of all, uh, we haven't made any decision. Second of all, I am of the similar mind to Dorothy that we're lucky if one would pass. Uh, and the third is... This is really an overtime statement. Uh, would we go out for two debt exclusion overrides in a year? God, I hope not. Uh, and um, so I, I, I'm really in favor of saying a debt exclusion override. And I still want to be very clear, there has been no commitment to that. Yeah, I mean, of course, and as uh, we know, there's no commitment until the council votes to put it on the ballot. It's a specific action that has to be taken. Right, Pat has her hand up. Yeah, Pat and I saw Kathy, it looked like she was waving her hand, but Pat? Uh, I feel differently. Um, I feel like I would like to keep in one or two debt exclusion overrides in the document. I don't know whether we can pass one or not. Uh, I don't, but it seems to me that if we put in there that it's one and then something happens and we need a second, there will be more resistance than there might have been. Um, and I don't know. So that's where I am a little bit, but I can go either way. Andy, let me explain my timing issue more. Um, the only possible uh, capital item that could come up in the next 12 months that would even be considered for debt exclusion, unless we went out for roads or something like that, would, is the library. Uh, the schools aren't going to come up for probably two years. And because we still don't have a solution for fire and DPW in, although we are now asking for the town manager to give us some options, um, we still wouldn't be to the point in either of those instances in this year to go out for debt exclusion. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking of this as a one year memo, but maybe that's not the right way to think about it from the committee standpoint. Kathy has her yeah. Kathy. You have to Kathy. Hi. Um, I was gonna make a similar statement to Lynn and you know, one way of drafting this, although I hate things that are drafted this way, to, to say A, debt exclusion override, and then after override, put the little S in, in parentheses. Um, if, but I don't think, because it's not on a time horizon that's anytime soon, and Sean can correct me, but because of the way the schools is moving and the uh, grant authority board is only meeting every other month when um, you know, we're not even at the invited in to go out and get an OPM uh, yet. And that's probably not gonna happen until February. So I think we're looking at FY24 at the earliest year. You know, so it's out not just two years, but probably three. So you know, raising this specter 
as, as multiple debt overrides in this document doesn't seem necessary. Um, why don't we just go ahead and change it to a debt exclusion override if unless somebody objects, I think we just have a consensus, enough of a um, statements on it and we need that'll enable us to keep moving forward I mean, it uh, leaves it open enough and ultimately whatever council is around, if a second one ends up being proposed, it's gonna have the right to make the decision and this document will be have been replaced by several other uh, financial the, uh, documents and several other budget guidelines along the way. So I think just changing it to a uh, is fine and making it a singular word. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, the track changes I'm doing are there. They're just, you know, I'm not using the feature that shows them. If you okay. want to, I will, but it means all of yeah. the- Yeah, and I'm writing it in the hand on, the, on a printed copy, the old fashioned way as, we go, as I go through it too. Okay. Um, so it'll give us a double check. Uh, there was a uh, general statement in the, I had a little bit of a problem and I'm not sure I would ever write it this way again, this overall um, philosophy, because I ended up even cutting a lot of it out because it does get repetitive of what's el elsewhere in the document. I tried to um, get rid of duplications as much as I could where things appeared more than once, but I didn't, wasn't perfect on doing it. Uh, sections on overrides and uh, reserve funds. Those and um, those are on page two. So, uh, Dorothy. I wanted to praise you for your many very specific statements on use of reserve funds. Um, it's very clear and you're, you say why, and, and I, I think that's excellent because um, you know we're here at this moment and we're talking about what we think and plan, but this document hopefully will live on past this us and this council. And I think that some of these um, policy ideas about how reserves are and are not used are major and very, very important to, keep, to be a well-run town. So I, I, I approve of them and I applaud you for them. Question is whether they represent the views of the committee and ultimately the views of the council, but thank you. The, uh, uh, this will, I'm gonna bring this up when we get to a little bit later in expenditures and, and take the detour over to schools and regional schools because we know that there's at least one member of the school committee who seems to feel strongly that we should be digging into reserves and getting more of an increase for schools and feels that the school funding is inadequate. And that is something that we're gonna have to uh, uh, just recognize. Um, but I, wanted to, I was gonna hold that for a minute, but it does come back to reserves. Uh, and uh, you know, we adopted the um, recommendation from the town manager to uh, not seek a override proposition two and a half operating budget override uh, for 2010. Uh, interestingly enough, Northampton had uh, done their override vote prior to the pandemic. Um, got it through. I'm not sure that it would have gotten through after the pandemic um, hit. Uh, but um, and, and we're sort of making that adopting very that statement. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, Dorothy, were you having something on that too, or is your hand up from before? Oh, it's 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 um. It's from up from before, but I just remember I was in New York City during the budget crisis. And um, I know what it's like when a city has not used its money well. And, you know, we were very paying attention 
Bob was working in the controller's office in the years of building back up the credit to make a strong city. And we're, we've come into this council with a strong uh, financial footing. And I just wanna make sure that we keep it that way. So um, the last thing on page two and then I'll, uh, is uh, the question of the four major capital investments is introduced for the first time and then it is continued further um, when we get into the uh, capital section, capital expenditure section later in the document. Uh, just wanna see if there's any uh, reaction to the specific statements made on page two as we just um, move through because um, Okay. Um, I think, Andy, I'm sorry. Yes. I think the one statement that I want to make sure stays in this document is this last one. And it really, um, I mean, we just cannot go through another fiscal crisis and delay these projects yet again. That's what happened in 2008, 9, 10. And we're still sitting on the same problems. And so it's, it's really a long-term view. The other piece that I think about in all of this is we really don't know what a COVID, a post-COVID Amherst is gonna look like in the next five years. There could be some serious reduced revenues um, and um, we just don't know. I mean, and I, that's without even getting into the school issue. Do you think that last thing that you said about we could have long, much longer term effect of COVID, we just don't know yet. Do you think that's stated strongly enough in the document elsewhere? Yes, I, I think you struck a very good balance on that, Andy. Okay. I mean, that's I would say I, I have a meeting along with Paul weekly with the bid and chamber and our businesses are just decimated. There will be, there many will be closing for the winter and the real prayer is going to be that they open in the spring. And, you know, and we don't know how fast UMass's population is going to um, be able to return. And just a variety of other things that dearly affect our revenue and can take times, take, take a long time to build back. And I think you've captured that, Andy. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're all too aware of it, just even from our own lives. Yeah. You know, yeah. who's comfortable going out a lot to restaurants? Haven't been meeting, meeting done take out, haven't been in one. <laughs> yeah, I'd buy you take out, but that doesn't give them the same profit because I don't buy my alcohol from them. Bernie? Yeah, um, just like to echo what Lynn was saying about keeping that sentence in. I mean, paradoxically, this period may be um, provide some opportunities because if things go the way we hope they go on the federal level, interest rates will stay way down. Amherst has got a good strong bond rating. Uh, we may be able to leverage up a construction, at least one construction project very, very favorably. And I, I think I faced this years ago as a selectman in Belchertown and we went ahead and jumped off the cliff and created a uh, community center. And um, um, it, it actually was a boost for the community. People felt that finally something was moving. Uh, and it really, it really turned out to be a morale boost. So, so we wanna keep our options open on this stuff, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that it is a, uh, do you think we should actually put something in a little bit more strongly stating that this, this is an historically low time for uh, interest rates and uh, that the major, the construction projects or capital projects in general? Should be I, think you, I think you have that later, Andy, when yeah. you said, you know, trying to read it for, 
what I'm remembering is you've got it. Um, whether you yeah, Matt, now that you say that, I probably do. Okay, yeah. so let's it's go on. Uh, as to whether there's anything else uh, as we're going through page three. I just want to say that I think this is a extremely well crafted statement and something that generally the public doesn't understand that the basically our reserves are our float. Yeah. <coughs> that is the hard hard thing for people <coughs> excuse me to understand. Well, it was this page that I that I was thinking of when I said how well written it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's clear, it's concise, and there's a common rationale through it. Uh, the money is used in places where it does it, it's leveraged, and it leads to some other way of paying itself back or creating more income. Or, um, yeah, it's very good. Okay. okay, so on page four, the first paragraph has to do uh, starts out with talking about the three institutions of higher education. And um, then the uh, last sec, uh, paragraph. is just encouraging looking for new opportunities and lobbying the legislature. Bernie? Andy, this is probably the only time I'll, I'll disagree about language in this document because I think overall it's really well crafted. I would not use the term pilot. Uh, that's anathema to anyone who's um, uh, managing a, a, a tax exempt organization, especially uh, especially colleges. The colleges um, I substitute, you know, the you know the uh, robust contributions from tax exempt organizations are essential or something like that, but I wouldn't use the term pilot. Okay. That's new. Um. So it would read something like, um, to use your exact words, that word that um, robust contributions from uh, educational um, or tax, tax, exempt. Uh, tax, tax exempt, exempt organizations are essential to the health of the town. Yeah. Yeah, that puts it, you know, if you go back and look at the, the great study that the Lincoln Land uh, Project did on working with tax exempts, they really emphasize that it's, you, you wanna talk about partnerships and collaboration as opposed to uh, as opposed as opposed to pilots which lock them into a formal legal agreement and and you know, I, I don't know of any attorney representing a, a tax exempt that would say yeah go ahead and sign one no I think you uh, I used it as a way of saying that uh, something else but I think you have it much better so we don't need to go back on it Bob Hegner yeah, I, I, the, the, the very last uh, phrase in this first paragraph, uh, when you talk about especially around creation of housing and commerce that can generate new revenue, I wonder if we should strengthen that by adding some thought about helping the, you know, the town businesses to recover from COVID. Um, because I think that you know, we, we might be able to leverage something from UMass and even Amherst College, that could really help the downtown more than just, you know, using the phrase commerce in general. I'm not sure quite how to word it, but, um, you know, maybe can generate new revenue, particularly after losses due to COVID-19 or something like that. 
maybe add that. Do that in, in replacement of, especially about the creation of housing and commerce that can generate new partnerships or in addition. If not, I can work through it and come up with a something that flows right. Kathy? Uh, yeah, on. I, I don't disagree with what Bob has just put in. Um, and I think he was particularly thinking of, you know, uh, it's revenues for our businesses, our local businesses. So it says commerce um, and it doesn't belong in this document, but the phrase I'd like is to in, avoid any actions that would undermine the health of the town businesses. And the example that I was told about is UMass um, offering to sell Thanksgiving dinners to off-campus homes for up to six people where they're directly competing with local restaurants and not paying taxes, not paying the same wages, not paying the same. So a feeling that it's unfair competition so I don't know, you know, this doesn't belong in this document, but I think we've got to worry about anything that undermines the local businesses, um, as well as urge them to be supporting of it. Actually, I think that maybe it does belong in here. Yeah, I'm just, I don't have the, the most politic way of wording it. You know, the, what I, I know is that uh, Harvard tried to, in put the word out, not just recently, but a long time ago, don't just open up a pizza shop downstairs and invite the public to come eat pizza on campus because suddenly that pizza shop is property that could be, you know, it's not educationally related. It's not in an exempt, but actually delivering food off campus to people for purchase has. Um, I think so often people uh, think of the word commerce as, you know, like some mini manufacturing. Right, as opposed so I, to. That's one reason why I'm even suggesting we put in the words housing, retail, restaurants, and other commerce. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. And I just said this, you know, if we had, could word it and avoid any actions <laughs> and partnership agreements to avoid any actions that would undermine the local, local businesses. Um, is I guess the nicest way. This, this is a difficult topic, and Dorothy, I just see your hand up, and I'll come to you in a second. Uh, the uh, problem that you're alluding to has been around for a while because we discussed that back you know, when I was on the select board. That the university, uh, through its uh, um, nationally recognized um, Food pro service um, was not only it was um, luring students to stay on campus, and actually um, it was just, uh, had gotten to the point of not allowing departments to go off campus to order lunches to bring onto campus for events. That if you had an event on campus, that they were requiring the use of the university's food service program. Decided to go ahead and show the track changes for, because of this. Um, it, it, this is a big problem. And when you have a dining uh, group that is as well known and appreciated as UMass Dining, you've got people who literally go to UMass to eat dinner. They pay ten dollars. They go in the cafeteria and they eat dinner. Uh, not anymore, but they used to. Yeah. Several hands up. You've got Kathy, Bernie, and Dorothy. Yeah, Dorothy was the one who was up next because she'd been asking for a little bit. Dorothy. Oh, when I first read this, I wrote down to explain. Um, an ex what do we have an example of UMass doing something, providing housing? And business, I mean, I know that 
I, or is this a reference to the buildings that were built by private uh, developers that happened to house UMass students downtown? I, I don't know of an example when they, when UMass did something that created housing for the town, um, but I haven't been here that long. So I need, I just wanted some examples. Okay, um, let me explain that and then I'll uh, get on to get back to Bernie. Um, with the, uh, U, what it was called the UTAC, the University Town uh, of Amherst Collaborative, there had been a proposal that the university provide land and they had taken some steps towards actually seeing if they could find interested parties who would participate in this, who would build um, both housing and um, commercial type of um, uses on certain pro on properties that were on the university owned land that they would essentially lease the land for private development for those purposes. And that had um, been under discussion for a while. And then I don't know what happened to it. It seems to have, have died um, as did most of the UTAC thing altogether. So are you, are you that was the reference. The um, mixed use uh, dorm that they are talking about putting on Massachusetts Avenue in the in the parking lots. It was the same builder. They were looking for a builder to do that and also rebuild North Village. Right. Yeah. Those are, no, those I, are two, those are two examples, and I just don't know where you know North Village was fifty percent closed even before they came up with this idea, and they were going to close the whole thing or not admit any more people into it, but rebuild on that North Village land, which is university land. But how does that help the town? It would be tax free. It, it creates housing, Dorothy. If they close down North Village, all those people have to find apartments or houses in town. They have promised them that they have an apartment in the new rebuilt thing. Just the relocated people, not new people. Okay. So all the it used to house a huge number of people, and it's only housing fifty percent oh, now. Oh, I see. Okay. Got you know, that. and so they were only going to do. They weren't going to bring anyone new, but they were going to build a new thing that would be Much dorm better. housing on that property. So it was university built with probably some pretty pricey dorms, but dorms apartments. You know, housing. Um, right, which meant that the graduate student families that were living there wouldn't be able to afford to rent right. those. Right. So it was not helping the town in any way that I can see. I think they actually relocated all of the families out of North Village. Uh, Temporarily. Uh, temporary. yeah, they, they, they had some space in Brandywine and Crestview and some of the other um, university properties up in, at least in the north part of town. Well, the other example goes back some, um, and I want to see what Bernie has to say, the Gateway Project um, that is now some years ago was to build along that section between of uh, North Pleasant Street between what is now the traffic circle and Kendrick Park up to campus on the, um, as you're going towards campus on the right side. Those were old fraternity houses that had been torn down and that land belongs to the university. And they were talking about uh, uh, a plan to uh, allow development of housing, which would have uh, taken some pressure off of rentals elsewhere in town. Uh, a lot of the neighbors in uh, along Fearing Street, which is the closest area to it, and uh, uh, were, were opposed to it because they felt that it would um, have a negative effect on their neighborhood. Uh, and uh, so it became quite controversial and the university ended up backing out of it. And that land still is now undeveloped uh, and is actually 
valuable property. And I think that university would like to do something with that land. And uh, it's an, that's a, you know, an example of the kind of thing that if it was done creatively could be a good partnership that would be beneficial to the university and beneficial to the town. Bernie, did you yeah, have uh, The universities, to pick up on that, the university system has had, it's taken its lumps when it's tried to uh, use private sector funds to develop dormitories. But um, I think we have to keep in mind that with UMass, um, the, the tuition goes into the general fund. Um, anything else, any other money that the university raises stays locally. So that's been a real incentive for them to do things like what they've done with food service. Uh, and, and the like. The other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, when we talk about downtown, Amherst College has um, a pretty significant presence there and has an impact. And, and Amherst College, I believe, is the town's largest taxpayer because it hasn't tried to claim educational exemption on a number of its buildings. Um, I correct something, Bernie. Uh, the university about five years ago, UMass Amherst, went we, to gain tuition. They don't, it does not go back to the general fund. No, it stays okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it shows you I haven't kept current. <laughs> Thank you. But I, but what I want to just mention to you, I mean, I've been in two meetings with UMass before COVID hit and not the, the project called the Gateway Project was never even mentioned. Uh, the project that um, I've been aware of, two of them, one is the project right down the street from Lincoln Ave, Dorothy. Yes. Where they talked about the mixed use building. And of course, one of the issues with that is the mixed use means it would be retail on the bottom, but it wouldn't be our retail. It, right be even less reason for people to come into town. The second one was the replacement of the North Village. And in, in both instances, they were looking for, and I don't know where they stand on this right now, they were looking for a private partner to build both of those buildings. Um, those private partnerships have been much more effective in greater population areas. And so whether or not it was ever going to be seen as a good investment and be attractive to a private partner to come out to Western Mass is still unclear. And given the university's present financial situation, which is pretty dire uh, the, because of lack of students, uh, I don't even know that they're even talking about those projects. And then the other conversation, just in full disclosure, um, although I, this is not, again, anything confidential because it was known publicly, we did have a conversation with the university to get them to try to donate land to build DPW. And so far that has never gone anywhere. They mm -hmm. mentioned uh, one parcel, which was just, uh, it would have been so costly for us to even get water and sewer there, it was ridiculous. And the parcel we wanted uh, was the one down by the old uh, non-functioning, never to have functioned heating plant and they have plans for that area. So mm -hmm. I think the issue that Kathy and others are getting at is the fact that the more the campus has made their own retail and restaurant conveniences on campus, the less people come into town. That's right. And that, and in fact, the more town people go to the university. And this is pre-COVID. Just, and there have been, not here, but in other places, and the, uh, in the ones I know are more the um, private nonprofit universities in Princeton, there were legal challenges to the part of the operation that was not directly education related, that the IRS exemption is if it's absolutely necessary. And UCLA, I went on their website recently because of this, they've been very careful to give instructions because where it's more commercial, but on campus, they pay sales tax, they potentially pay property taxes. Um, you know, so it's, 
uh, it's not always willing, you know, to, to make it a more even playing field with the downtown businesses who um, an Amherst College's copying center had to start charging sales tax because not only did it get free rent, um, but it didn't charge sales tax. So it could completely undercut collective copies and they're a block away from each other. You know, so it's those kind of examples where people say, wait a minute, it's you can go get 100 copies here or 100 copies there. Why? You know, or the textbooks being sold to the public. So they do differentiate if it's a student coming in for a textbook. But but some of these are potential legal challenges. If you if one wanted to take them on, you'd rather have the behavior change, um, you know, then get into a legal challenge. But Princeton settled for around $11 million. So here's what I suggest to get this moving along. Yeah. And um, then I'll see, uh, get back to Dorothy to just see if there's anything she wants to add at that point. And that is that Lynn and I can take a stab at this paragraph and see if we can come up with language that gets at the major points that we have just discussed about uh, working with the university to make sure that we're looking for partnerships that are beneficial to both partners and that we encourage the university um, and other partners to not engage in activities which are detrimental to the business community and the health of the town. Uh, and to get see if we can find language that we're comfortable with both of those. And then we'll just send them to you and ask for you to send comments back just to one of us. It won't, if, if we send you a draft of this paragraph and you respond just to one of us, I think we're okay with open meeting. It can't be just, it can't be a reply to all, however, if we do. Reply all. <laughs> But Dorothy wants to speak, and then I have two yeah. other points on this paragraph. I do want to make okay, sure. Dorothy? Uh, I just want to um, have us imagine that we are in a on again, off again, um, COVID type situation for a longer period in the future. And that the model that UMass might follow is that of Amherst College, which is to kind of clamp a Stephen King uh, bowl over the campus and say, okay, we'll give you campus life, but you have to stay on this campus because I think they're going to find that people are not going to pay the tuition for total online education. That's why they're saying they're trying to get the students back on. And that would mean that, that the Amherst economic model of downtown, which is mostly bars and food, which is not necessarily patronized that much by the non-university people in the town is going to have to change. So, um, I, I, we, we just have to keep the possibility because Amherst College, I mean, um, I just got this notice about this menorah lighting that's gonna take place at um, no, the mill, Cinda's place, because they're not having it on Amherst College campus. I mean, all the activities that were done, they're not happening if it involves intersection of two groups of people. And it's the sealed campus and UMass could do that. And as you say, they've got the food which is number one. Um, so somehow we've got to think about that. Um, Andy, yeah. there's things on this paragraph. Uh, the university has done robust COVID-19 screening, but it's only been of their faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and it's only as of yesterday that they've announced their willingness to do asymptomatic testing. testing. So, um, I think we just need to clarify that. Well, we can take care of that as we do the, the round of the paragraph. And then the other, I just want to mention, I don't believe there's any discussion going on about a partnership agreement. Well, you'd mentioned that. Yeah. And I think that I had actually modified the draft from a prior version mm -hmm. that you had mm -hmm. seen to eliminate that. Um, I want to keep moving, however, because we've got a lot of territory yet to cover. Um, so is there... Beeping, Carol. 
going Sorry. to the last paragraph, otherwise we'll go on to revenue is pretty straightforward. I don't know if there are any comments on either the last paragraph there or the paragraphs on revenue, but I'll pause for a moment to allow people to glance through. Because I think that the big thing is uh, when we get to expenses for operations and expenses for capital. Andy. Yep. I have to say, when I got to this number, it, you know, knowing two and a half, I, um, I just want to make sure that we read it and make sure that we all understand how we get from two and a half to three point two percent. Yeah, I I actually checked Andy's math, and he is of course accurate and it's because of the adding in new growth. So that plus the two and a half, that right. new growth was that extra percentage. So, um, I mean, it, it says that, but, you know, I said, does, did it really add that much? And the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other, the other thing just to throw in there, if I'm reading it correctly, is your local revenues are going up for FY22 as well. What's going up? The local receipts. So if this is if this is three point two over the FY twenty one, okay. our FY twenty two projections, we do have the local receipts going up because we right. compared we, to the year be compared to the year before. Compared yeah. to the year before, they're going up great. You know, they're going up at I think it was eleven percent or twelve percent or something because we reduced it so much for FY twenty one. Is there a need to go farther into that? Because the uh, that that may be the benefit of uh, a benefit amongst many of the charts that uh, you're going to stick on at the end. Because that yeah, will, it'll, it'll it'll show show it. yeah, local receipts are going up twelve point seven percent in the the original projection. Mm -hmm. And then you explain the two and a half right here. If there's nothing else on that. Um, on the revenue side, then we should get on to the expenses for operations. And I don't, um, in the first paragraph mentions regional school assessment. So I'm going to pause from this discussion for a moment. Uh, did uh, Bernie? Did you get it? And Bob? Did you get a chance to either watch the uh, attend the meeting as a uh, uh, attendee or um, Bob was there. Bob was know, there. Yeah, Bob was there. It's just, okay. Yeah. No, I I I was not there. I tried to. I I I signed in, but there was nothing on the screen. Oh, okay. Nothing got broadcast either on Amherst um, Media or on the Zoom call. So I, I sat around for half an hour waiting, but nothing ever happened. Yeah, and that's because we moved off the Zoom call to a Google Meet and... Ah, uh, and then it wasn't on the, Amherst Media either. Yeah, no, it was, a, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so no, the kid, me, I, I wasn't um, able to get, to get it. Yeah, let me summarize um, um, several aspects of it. And um, other members of the committee who were there will add to it. And uh, the item that I sent you in the mail, if we need it, Lynn has it to put on the screen. Uh, but I'm going to, what we're effectively doing right now um, is to uh, pause our discussion of this particular agenda item and um, then come back to. Uh, to it in a few minutes, but to go to the agenda item having to do with the four town meeting and uh, uh, what basically 
happened in the four town meetings uh, was several different things. One was that um, superintendent and the finance director presented the budget and the budget that they talked about uh, was actually two different versions of a budget, but neither of the budgets were uh, at a level uh, funding scenario. So, uh, and so that the calculations of what our assessment would be for regional schools under either of those budgets, under any of the different methods for allocating amongst the four towns, the assessments were all increasing, not level. So that was one element of what was happening in that discussion. Uh, another element of what was happening in that discussion was after, uh, during the breakout and then where each town met separately and then came back and made comments is that uh, it was clear that Chutesbury, which has been pressing forever about trying to increase our share and decrease their share by moving towards the statutory formula as opposed to a formula that we negotiate amongst the four towns uh, that they've indicated, at least there was an indication of continued pressure in that direction. <clears throat> and then the third thing that I wanted to note was is that one member of our own school committee actually expressed unhappiness about the level funding question and didn't really say where more money would come from, but uh, was uh, feeling that uh, the uh, discussion that had taken place that's the basis of this whole uh, guidelines that we're talking about, which was the financial indicators meeting, <clears throat> had a flaw in it because uh, at least in that school committee member's mind, uh, something should have been done differently. And the only thing that was logical, though it was not the words that this uh, member said, was uh, use of reserves to fund uh, some of the operating expenses for the year. So those were kind of the three major takeaways that I had from that discussion. Uh, is there any other members of the committee who were present. Let's see, I think I see one hand up and that's Kathy. So Kathy, did you have something to add? Yeah, just a, a couple of things to add when you stare at this micro um, to extent people's eyes can do it on the very first line, the um, reduction of 1.4 million gets you to 32.1 million, which is about the same uh, total funding as the year before. So in that case, it got you down. It just doesn't get Amherst down to total. Um, and there is a capital side that has to be funded too. So th that's just a piece of information. Um, the second thing is I asked, um, the, the union contracts, as we talked about last time, are open for renegotiation, but I, I asked with the steps that are built in um, to the current contract, how much would the wage and set, we know that the health insurance is going up by 5%, so how much is the um, wage and salary component going up if you just did steps? And the answer was a guesstimate um, of roughly 3%. Um, you know, without a COLA. So that I just was trying to get a sense of, you know, how tough this is. So the the comments that then were made is this will start to get to personnel. I mean, this, you know, to, to get to this number um, to make this work. Now, the only other piece um, that I thought um, was made clearer to me during this meeting is that we've had some loss of enrollment, both 
well, in the regional school, in the elementary, and it potentially puts our chapter 70 money at risk because DESE computes it. And there is a discussion that people understand um, that we're in unusual time, but that's been a flight of, of some affluent people. They'd done a survey, where did people go? And some of them bought into a, they didn't leave town. They just bought into private because it was open. Um, so if school got back to in-person, they'd come back. But that's, so that assumption that chapter 70 stays flat right now is optimistic, even if the state didn't cut it, the way the formula works, if it got counted against us. So, so you could see the nervousness with this budget. Um, and then last night, then the only other thing is last night, the presentation on the state of the schools showed what the enrollment is in the schools, in the middle school and in the high school. And with the, over time, we're down to a very low student to teacher ratio, you know, if people looked at it. Um, so that is part of what they're confronting in this overall budget. So there was a protest that 1.4 really hurts. And the other one they gave us was 1 million. That also hurts, you know, that, it's not going to be easy to juggle the way they just did for FY21. Sean? Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify um, two things. So the the 3% number for payroll, I just want to clarify, that's not 3% of the total budget. If I don't know if people are thinking that, but it's not 3% of the total budget. It's 3% of the payroll line, which you can't really... Right. Uh, can't really tease that out from this data, but I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, and then the other piece on chapter 70, just as a, um, a to your line. refresher, that as long as the hold harmless provision is in chapter 70, um, which it has been for many years, our cha the chapter 70 doesn't go down if enrollment okay. goes down. Um, it stays, it'll stay flat. And it, it only, it does have one adverse effect, which is if there's um, a minimum increase, which they typically do, like a $25 per kid increase or $30 per student increase. Um, that'll be lower if we have fewer students, but it, it's a really, really small amount okay. of money each year. Um, but if they take away hold harmless, then, um, you know, obviously none of that is valid. And, and John, there was a run uh, earlier this fall or earlier this year. I can't remember when it was with that white paper that was released by the group in Boston. Um, yeah. Yeah. The business people trying to get rid of Hold Harmless, but there's like 180 cities and towns, our towns that still benefit from Hold Harmless. And so politically, it doesn't seem like it would happen. Uh, I just wanna to speak to the enrollment trends. The schools have been losing enrollment to begin with. And so, this additional enrollment loss, whether it's permanent or not, is, is on top of an already declining enrollment problem that is nationwide and particularly bad for New England. Um, so it's, there, I, I feel like the schools are approach, approaching a serious problem in that they do not have the widespread um, reaches into the general population of Amherst because so many people no longer have kids in schools or never did. And uh, they look at these numbers and they say, wait a minute, how can you continue to charge that if enrollments are going down? So I, there's a, this is not a small conversation. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just want to add that um, I agree with what Lynn said. I want to add a, a, another caution in that um, a lot of the the, uh, the the people that I know um, have enrolled their kids in private schools in, at the elementary level or at the preschool level. And, you know, once kids get into a school and get friends and get, you know, part of that place, there's a reluctance to move them out of there into public schools. So I don't, I would not assume that the, the flight to private schools is temporary. I think it's more going to be more 
persistent um, than than what we would hope for. So, and I would like to also add there is a serious racial and uh, economic inequity caused by that flight, which unfortunately then correlates directly to special needs. Oh, absolutely. And, and private schools do not provide special needs. We had to pull our son out of a private elementary school because of that. So it, it, in, in many ways, the students that will be staying end up bringing greater costs with them percentage wise. Absolutely. Bernie, you have something? Yeah, I'm just sort of a, I'm sort of chuckling here because uh, my grandkids are headed the opposite direction. They, 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 the two that are school age came out of private school and are, are much better served in the Amherst school system. Uh, although I, I think the, uh, uh, in the third one will be going to the Amherst school system. Um, I, I, I do, I do worry about the imbalance that's taking place in social and economic imbalances that are taking place because of, um, <clears throat> of the flight, if you will, or the, to, uh, to, to uh, private schools. Um, I, I've had some conversations with folks who I refer to as COVID, COVID refugees who are, are moved into the area because they don't want to be in the big city anymore. Um, and, you know, the first thought was, well, what private school will we send our kids to? So I think we're going to see that, and, and we'll, we'll, we're not going to see an easy, Bob's point's well taken, we're not going to see a, see a sudden reversal of this. Um, once kids get settled in, they get settled in. Yep. The uh, <clears throat> schools did do a survey of the um, students who left, families of students who left the district and it was published about a week ago and is available on the school's website apparently, though I have not had a chance to look at it. I don't know if anybody else in the committee has. There's a live link if you go on the um, town council's packet for last night in the school presentation, there's a live link to that survey. Yeah, I have a copy, I can send it to people too. So both ways. Yeah, I mean, there's. It's there. The question is, are there anybody has any comments from it? My understanding was that it has a finding that maybe half will come back, but certainly wasn't predicting from what I understand that all would come back. It correlates to what we have to say. Um, I. Uh, Bring us back to the, because uh, I don't know that we really can do anything right now about the Fort Towns meeting discussion, other than I wanted to make the committee aware of it and that there will be another Fort Towns meeting, which will be uh, with a much more complete budget presentation than was made at this particular meeting, probably in January. So they're thinking that there may be three Fort Town meetings this year instead of two. Uh, so this committee will be coming back to the subject, uh, but we'll get back to the agenda item of the draft and uh, into the expenses for operations. And I also want to say uh, something to we. I know that we have a couple of attendees who are here, and uh, we have a public comment period, and. Uh, I may ask um, after, as we're discuss at some point as we're discussing this next section on expenses for the operating side of the budget, um, if there are public comments, because I think it'd be reasonable to, um, if the public comments are related to the um, topic we're now going to be talking about, that we hear it during that period of time. So I just wanted to uh, say that so that the attendees would recognize that uh, public comment is coming and that I do recognize their participation. So um, having said that, uh, I wanna uh, at least start the conversation 
Uh, and uh, let me ask, first of all, whether we should add some, um, a little bit more to the regional school discussion, just recognizing the four town meeting and uh, is uh, a, something that adds to the concern or something to that nature uh, so that it's a current document. Dorothy, were you going to speak on that or something else? Uh, yeah, I had a, a quick question. If we if we go to the um, state mandated, uh, the, the, if we if we change the assessment method method where Amherst pays more, what is the impact of that going to be? Huge. So I just think maybe that should be is is that clearly stated in here? I mean, it could happen, couldn't it? Or do you think it's not going to happen? Um, it could happen because you have to remember that the uh, how the system works uh, by statute and um, is that the statute provides that the statutory formula is what is applied unless all four towns agree to an alternative method. And there's Shutesbury has always had divided votes as to whether they should just reject the proposed formula uh, and uh, force everybody onto the uh, statutory method. And uh, so their demand that we move in that direction uh, has, uh, they, they have the ability to enforce it if they can get a majority of their town meeting to, uh, reject the assessment method agreement proposed by the school committee, which has always been the one that's been uh, coming out of um, our joint discussions. And they've been picking up a percentage of votes. I mean, it's getting, been getting closer and closer over the years from what people who go to the Shrewsbury Town Meeting have reported. Uh, anything else, Dorothy? And if not, I'll go on. No, that was just, just do we have a plan to deal with it if that should happen? Uh, we really don't have a lot of choices that are available to us. And uh, we are going to have to uh, consider that uh, in, in as we go into the future as to what we are driven to do. Uh, I think one of the things that we've always been saying is, is that if it goes too hard, we may have to talk to other towns about reducing, forcing a reduction of the budget, which would um, have an educational impact. And that uh, then the question is gonna be everybody's pointing their fingers as to who's responsible um, for having had that redu forced reduction in the school budget. Uh, Bob. Yeah, I was just going to suggest uh, following up with Dorothy that maybe at a future meeting, not too distant, not too distant future, we, you know, discuss like, what are the options? You know, what are the two or three things are, that we could do and what are the implications should we, you know, find ourselves in the situation where the assessment to Amherst goes way up? You know, I mean, we could cut something from the school, we could cut something from capital projects, we could reach into reserves. I mean, all those have implications. Um, and maybe lay those out. I mean, it's just a thought we lay those out so people understand what the, what the choices are and what the implications are. That's good. Um, I think we will have that discussion at some point. It's going to be a uh, very delicate and difficult conversation to have, but one can't avoid. Uh, so I don't know that on the theme of what we said that there's a big change other than to recognize that uh, put in some recognition of the four towns meeting which I can do easily. 
So let's go on and uh, to the next sections. Uh, Because we're, uh, we're, as we previously discussed, adopting the level, um, the overall level budget. But then the question comes to, to the um, budget itself. Uh, and uh, then the last two or three paragraphs really are. I think the critical ones, and uh, I have had some discussion with a couple of members of the committee about uh, those two paragraphs. Why don't we stop there so the people at home, and by the way, for anybody who's uh, for our uh, now it's up to four attendees, but for anybody who wants to know that you can find the um, items that we're looking at in the, um, in the packet for today's meeting. And the way to find the packet for today's meeting is to go to the town website, uh, look under government and then town council. And then after you get town council, you go to committees and you said, and if you go to finance committee from there, you find packets and you can find today's packets and anything that's being discussed today is in the public packet. Uh, you can also so, the main page of the town's website, go to the calendar and just punch on finance committee and it's, and then go to the word here and it's all there. So Dorothy, do you have something? You're muted, Dorothy. No, the hand is still up. I, I had I had my thing on attendees and I didn't see. Okay. Because um, here's where we're getting into the question of um, we built in recognition of um, the community safety working group and uh, that their, the community services working group is going to be looking at the community health and safety in racial equity and social justice goals for our, that were um, provided for the town manager and, was, and that the um, Energy Climate and Action Committee is gonna be looking at those goals, the, the, go, or the, the goal that's related to energy. And we wanna we want to make sure that um, there's consideration given the way it's written right now is consideration given to those particular uh, processes as the municipal budget is developed. But um, we're not suggesting any more detailed statement. And I will explain why if somebody asks, but I'm not going to do it otherwise. Uh, why I did it that way. So I didn't know if there was any comment. So looking first to the committee, and then I'm going to pause and see. I know that there's at least one attendee who's uh, asked to be recognized at this point. So I want to make sure that um, I will um, pause and uh, do a, at least a portion of the community uh, of the public comment period to allow public comment at this stage on those two issues. I see two hands up. Um, Lynn, are you a, as manager of the meeting, are you able to bring people in? I think I just did. Zoe Crabtree. <laughs> okay, Hi. Zoe. Hi, hi, Zoe. Could you uh, give your name, uh, just introduce yourself to the rest of the committee, tell them where you live, and then uh, please go ahead We're uh, make your comment. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. Um, so my name is uh, Zoe Crabtree. I live in District 5. Um, 
I checked the packet earlier this week and just saw the agenda. So I haven't had a chance to read the whole draft because I've been taking notes as you all speak. Um, but I just came across um, a line that I would really like to um, push you all on. Um, you say at the section, um, the second to last paragraph in the uh, operating expenses section um, on page six, um, there is a sentence that says, uh, we note explicitly that adding new initiatives, be it investments in climate action or racial justice, will mean that there will have to be reductions in other areas of the budget. Uh, we recognize that we have not provided guidance on what to reduce and rely on the best judgment of you and your staff. Um, I think that uh, this, is the, this is exactly what your job is supposed to be, is to provide guidance um, in the budget guidelines uh, for uh, how money should be spent and not spent. Um, and uh, I mean, you've heard me speak on this matter uh, a lot over the past couple of months. So I would really appreciate um, if there was a line in here about defunding the police. I feel like we've made um, a really strong case over the last several months and you all have heard, heard it. Um, and we've heard that there is, we've heard that you say that you have heard us um, and we continue, I feel, uh, to be met with evidence that shows that you have not heard us. Um, and uh, it would be nice if in the budget guidelines for the next year's budget, uh, as you told us to, you know, Paul Bachman told us to pay attention and to participate in the process. Um, and we have done that. Uh, and it would be nice to see that reflected in, in your work going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... In the Legra, um, in the, I see her hand up. I see Lydia. So, hold on. Let me just see if I can figure out how to remove Zoe. If I remove you and you disconnect, my deepest apologies. This is not my forte. Oops, that I can't do it that way. Um, All right, maybe I do it that way. Okay. Zoe, are you still there? I hope. Uh, raise your hand just to it's, let me know you're still here. It's still showing up as a. I did it. <laughs> All right. Allegra is next. Hi, Allegra. Hi. How are you? Okay. So introduce yourself to the committee, please. Tell us, uh, tell the committee where you live and. Uh, because we have a couple of uh, resident members who are not members of the council and may not have uh, met you from pu previous public comment and then go ahead and offer your comments. Yes, my name is Allegra Clark. I am an Amherst resident in district two. Um, I am also working with the group who hopes to defund the police and move money from the police into other areas of the budget that will elevate the needs of the Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in our community. Um, I do see that you've put that the Community Safety Working Group is also a newly formed committee that is working on some recommendations and um, it's our hope that some of those recommendations will come up with new ways to keep the community safe that don't involve the police and that these recommendations will come with funding. Um, so again, echoing what Zoe said, that there are new initiatives and whether they are investments in climate action, racial justice, there will be reductions in other areas of the budget. And we hope that that area of the budget will be the police department. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Allegra. And uh, last person I uh, noticed that Linda's struggling with uh, how to handle all of this, Lydia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Same, same request, please. And introduce sure. yourself to the committee and uh, offer your comments. 
Okay, my name is Lydia Irons. Um, I live on Jeffrey Lane in Amherst. Um, and I hopped into this meeting late because I was helping my five-year-old with virtual kindergarten. But as soon as I got on the call, I heard um, Robert mention that what they were not aware, like where the budget could be cut and perhaps we could cut it from the schools. And um, I don't know if I heard that correctly or not, but if that's the case and something that you all are thinking about potentially doing, I'm like looking over at her basket of supplies lovingly put together by her teacher. And I know for a fact, a lot of those things were bought with that teacher's own money. Um, and it would be, uh, Oh, it would be a real disservice to the children in our community to cut money from the school when our police budget is, um, you know, very large and inflated. Um, I also know that my husband is a paraprofessional at the high school and the stress that all of those teachers are going under of trying to figure out with the union and, re and negotiating and opening and not opening um, thinking about going into the next budget with a potential cut to their funding just seems um, inhumane and would be very taxing for people who are already so, are working so hard to bring the best that they can. And as we have brought to all of you before and we will continue to bring to you, um, please consider defunding the Amherst Police Department and their budget because they have more money than they need um, to do a job that they don't do particularly well. And I also would like you to remember that just because there's only three of us that could jump on this call does not mean that there's only three of us who would like to talk to you about this matter. We hope that you've been getting emails from folks who can't come to these calls. Um, and we've been doing a lot of canvassing around Amherst and been getting a lot of support from people. And um, we would really appreciate it if you could name defunding the police as a priority as you move forward. Thank you. Um, Lynn, I'm gonna count on you just continuing to manage because- uh, Yes. The, uh, the public, there's still two hands raised, so I need to ask uh, Allegra and Lydia, unless you wanted to comment again, please lower your hands. I guess I can do that. I, I just did it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the normal operator here. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Uh, I I, we're gonna, I, we need to continue. They're still listed as panelists, but... Uh... I don't think that it. Um, I'll, I can take care. But in any event, there's they're all. Everybody's been now been moved back to attendee. Okay. okay. Um, so going back to to the group at hand and uh, discussion in that paragraph that we're talking about. Um, and I'm not saying that this is a strong enough statement um, to um, fully respond to what was just offered, but the um, near the top, the third sentence that begins, there has been public comment. And I think you'll see it. Um, the, yep, that, that sentence was put in there so that we recognize that we have been hearing from the public and uh, that it be recognized in the document itself. So I guess that's the first thing that uh, I wanted to just point out. Uh, I think that there's one other thing that I wanted to say, and then I wanted to see if there's reactions that come from the um, members of the finance committee then as a, uh, uh, now that we're back to the finance committee discussion of the document. Uh, this 
state law and the charter actually limit the council's role at this point and we're playing a very delicate balance because both state law and the uh, charter provide that the town manager or mayor, whatever your former go city government is, will provide a budget recommendation by a date specific in the charter it is uh, stated as May 1st. So that's what, we that's what we operate under. And that the council then can accept or, re um, or reduce any amount from the recommended budget that has been proposed by the executive, which is the mayor or the, uh, in our case, the town manager. So that we um, can ask that uh, the town manager consider something, but um, if we go beyond that, we're getting into a question as to whether we are crossing the line of what the council's role is at this period for either the, uh, uh, for any of the, any purposes uh, in, in whether it, it's an appropriate following of the particular rules of the charter and the statute in the, in the charter, of course, was adopted to conform with the statute, the, the state law. So I just wanted to make that particularly uh, particular explanation so that uh, um, everybody understands why the wording I chose was what it is. Um, but I see two members of the committee whose hands are up and um, uh, the first one who had uh, raised your hand was Kathy. So Kathy? Um, yes, when I, I'm, as I'm sure everyone who's on this Zoom call remembers um, last June, um, I initially suggested um, reducing the police department by two slots and um, at that point, we were taught, and, and particularly because there were vacancies, so we weren't directly affecting a person, so just not hire. And we were told that the impact of that would to be to lose that money and we would lose it off the base. So if what we really wanted to do was to shift some funding to alternatives, um, that we could freeze those positions. And we're due to get a report in January on potential alternatives. So whether it's social services, public health, um, something that's on the safety theme was what we asked for and looking at other communities. So I'm, what I'm wondering, Andy, with, you know, given the caveats you just meant, um, it's very clear that once the budget arrives on our door, we can cut, but we can't move. So could, can we, within charter and state limits, put a sentence in here that re references what we talked about last year, as we suggested last year, one place to look is the police department and whether we could um, support it at a lower funding level and use uh, that to um, support particularly the safety initiatives. So can we, and this would be, and we encourage you to think that way. Can we put it in some way that doesn't get us into, we just can't say that. Cause we did find an artful way of wording the freeze and make it clear what we were looking for. Um, so um, that's what, can we add a sentence um, that's worded in a way that indicates a possible place to look or a suggested place to look is the police department. Because I, I, the, the, um, when Lydia came on and made a comment, we, we weren't suggesting that, uh, you know, the issue on flat budgets is we're concerned on what flat budgets are going to do to schools, to the town in general, um, particularly to schools. Um, but so can we, can we put a sentence in there to address 
needs in other areas to address recommendations that come out of the group so that we don't talk about a dollar level. We don't talk anything explicit, but we suggest that that's one possible source. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the one response I'm gonna have just real quick is that that's why the language is in there that we wanted him to consider the recommendations of the working group but uh, is that sort of- I guess what I'm saying is the council is already on, finance committee is on record and the council's on record with what we said last June. So I'm just trying to bring that back in, um, not to, to stay silent on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat? There's a, a level in which I agree with Kathy uh, but I do believe that the if we're going to do that kind of uh, specific, and I would like us to do that, um, it needs to be focused on the community safety working group because they are the body that is looking into the investigation of the police department's practices, et cetera, and services and, and trying to make some real um, conditions um, and, and progress in changing how safety services are delivered. My other, my concern is that I do wanna see the freeze continue um, of the two positions and how we bring that forward, I'm not sure. Um, but I think some kind of more specific mention uh, focused on the community safety working group would be helpful. Lynn has her hand up, Andy, too. Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think well, we went through a very, very serious discussion about this. It led to the freeze and it led to the community safety working group. The town manager increased the selection committee to select that group. And when I speak with the town manager in my weekly conversation with him, I always ask about this. Mm -hmm. The group is meeting weekly. They plan to have a report to the town manager by January 15th. Uh, if there's a point where we as a council feel we need to come back on the guidelines based on whatever that report says, we can always do that. But We've taken a big step to support the community safety working group and to open that door for thoughtful recommendations from a group of seven people, six of whom are BIPOC, um, to come forward with recommendations. And I feel as much, I, I am open to whatever recommendations they come forward with but I don't feel we should in this document at this time, tie their hands. What the draft of course now says is the council will want the working group recommendations considered in budget. And you know, sort of, I think that that draft was in line with Kind of the expression that Lynn just right. talked. Oh. Kathy, go ahead. I, I, you know, I agree with what you just said, Lynn, but I think what Pat was suggesting, if I look at this paragraph, that if we broke the paragraph into two paragraphs, so the first part was the council, and I'm doing this as a suggestion, Lynn, so don't do it yet, um, you know, want the working group's recommended is considered in the budget period, and then move that next section, which starts on the climate action group, down to a new paragraph. Um, you know, and since we're writing this to Paul, you know, if we said, as you know, last year, we, um, you and we and the council agreed to freeze two positions in the police department, um, and that is a potential source of revenues to fund such initiatives. So I just, what I'm trying to do, Lynn, is not a specific, what do we want to spend it on, but to bring back in, right. not be silent on the fact that we took an action um, and, and want to keep that as a potential source. So I'm 
trying to wordsmith while not having my hands on the typewriter, but I would break it. So as Pat said, not, you know, and then had the flow, then the rest flows fine. Then similarly the action and that's fine. That whole paragraph still works for that, you know? So, but just to add a sentence at the end of this safety work group, you know, one possible source, um, is the police department. And as you know, last year, we froze two positions to um, make such a consideration possible or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I just want to bring it back in. Yeah. And, and that was an agreement. It's FY21. Dorothy? I just want to second that. Um, we have so many pieces of paper and so many reports, and the burden is that we should carry forward significant or related facts with them so that we don't get, things don't get lost. And um, we did take an action, and we just need to state that we took that action. We don't have to say what's going to happen, but um, it should be there. And that's one reason I really like so much of this report is that I feel it's, uh, it does explain, it tries to put things in context. And um, as I read it, I say, oh yes, I remember that. We did talk about that. Um, so it can stand on its own. If you always have to have reference to all these other documents, it's just very hard to go forward with business. So I think that's a good idea. I'm, I'm just writing a sentence and this is draft. Maybe I should stop before I get there. I think right after alternative approaches probably works, Lynn, a period right there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of what we said last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for health and safety and social equity, you know, it's for the whole. But something like that, I feel is acknowledging that yeah. we were, we were yeah. serious. Yeah. You just need a grammatical correction, yeah. comma after, uh, um, while the town, comma, through the community safety working group, comma, explores with an S alternative approaches. Yeah. Thank you. And I think it's the FY21 budget. <laughs> oh, so that's where Kathy comes in. She knows Thank that. You. Yeah. It is the FY21 budget. I'm, I'm fine with that. Good. And you need the S after explore, Lynn. It's, it's the, the town. Town it controls explores. the verb explores, yeah. It's just, the verb is explores, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just, if we're ready to move on, <clears throat> paragraph, the Climate Action Committee is coming forward to make recommendations. I just don't know when uh, they haven't clarified that with me. So, so, that, should, so that should be changed, the Climate Act will make. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. We'll be making works. Will be making. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you, I'm not sure how I feel about this yet, but if we're if it's just getting the wording right in the sentence we're adding first, um, instead of in FY21, it was in in or for the FY21 budget or in the FY21 budget because the action is about the budget decision, not mm -hmm. something that happened for the year. Right. Good. Tama there. Great. 
right here. I think. Yeah, so. uh, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah okay. that's in the FY21. Where you have FY21, it was in adopting the FY21 budget. That in adopting, right, excellent. Let me go back on one other comment that Pat made, and that is that I think if we, you know, hear from the uh, working group, you know, by mid December, mid January, that they need more time, we can give them more time at that point. But they have um, evidently jumped in with both feet and are working very, very hard and uh, have made this commitment. And Paul, I think, feels like they really want to honor that commitment of getting something to us in January. Pat has her hand up. Yeah, Pat? Yeah, I've been uh, sitting in as an attendee on those meetings and they are um, pretty clear that they are gonna ask for more time. Oh, okay. Yeah, to, to make, a, to make real depthful re recommendations. And, and we'll bring that to, Paul would bring that to the council and, yes and yes agree. and I, I don't see a problem with that i don't either but. i guess in my hesitation i said that i wanted to get the language so we all agreed it's the right <laughs> language for the sentence but uh, it does seem like in respecting the roles of the chart in the charter, uh, that we're really running close to a line. I, I, I guess, Andy, you know, I've got the, the charter. It's all dog-eared and keeps falling apart on me because it's easier than... Um, at the end, we clearly have restrictions. At the beginning of the budget process, it's silent. Um, we can ask questions, we can be making considerations. So I think in these guidelines, this kind of language is not um, a violation of that. Right. Um, you know, so it, it, it uh, yeah. And it is a suggestion we're making. We're saying one possible thing is to continue something that we've looked at before. Bernie, Bernie has his hand up. Yeah, I, I think the, the, these are suggestions. The whole document's a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's perfectly appropriate for the the committee uh, the, and the council to make these recommendations to um, to the town manager. I will voice the concern I voiced a couple of meetings ago. I don't know that it's necessarily a good idea to anchor on the value of two positions in crafting a, uh, a response. Uh, hopefully the community working group is not feeling um, confined by that. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, if this is the way folks want to go, I'm, I'm not going to object to it. Um, Bernie, do you think this suggests that that's the total amount of money and that's all the money there is? Or does it just, well, uh, what I was I, trying to do is just reference something we'd already agreed to. Well, I, I think if, yeah, if you make it as a reference, you know, well, we already agreed to do this. But, but uh, um, again, I, um, <laughs> I, I, this is a very complicated and complex problem that's gonna require some fine tuning and, and dancing around. And my, my concern is, is that we don't start to build barriers um, either to say that we're gonna take all this money from the cops or we're gonna just limit whatever we do in response to the, the value of these two positions. So that's all. I, 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 um, 
you know, I think as, as it's, I, I could read this as, well, you know, this is what you're suggest. This is what we suggested we do. This is, um, this is symbolic. Yeah. Um, it is symbolic and it was symbolic. Um, I'm not ready to defund the police. Um, I'm ready to listen to the recommendations of the Community Safety Working Group and have them direct how we um, examine uh, police services, et cetera, and for their report to inform our decisions. Um, that's, that's so this right. is a symbolic statement, I know that. It, and it was a year ago when we did it. It, it is totally symbolic. Okay, but, you know, as long as we're in agreement that this is a statement of what's happened in the past. and, and Right, not a, right. Not, not a, saying this is what we want you to do because we don't, right. yeah, I agree, absolutely. Good point. Okay. I think we're about ready to move on. Um, so I don't see any other hands besides Bernie and Pat that were up. Um, the one thing that I just wanted to explain, including to the uh, attendees who are still on the call, uh, are still attending the meeting. You know, I, I, my background was in civil legal aid, and I worked. I was director of the Western Massachusetts Civil Legal Aid Program for 25 years and have worked in legal aid for 35 years total and worked with a lot of people from the low-income community, um, uh, including substantial, obviously, numbers of people of color because that's a lot of our uh, poverty and uh, race, unfortunately, but in reality, run together. And uh, low-income people, uh, are both victims of crime and uh, people who are accused of crime. It, this makes it a very delicate issue because I'm not sure where it falls at all times as to what attitudes of people who are living their lives in poverty um, are feeling because when they are victims, they want help and they deserve help. And uh, so it's, it, this is a very tough issue and the other thing that um, I know it, we did last year was we had some fairly extensive conversations in June with uh, the police department, both the chief and the two captains about their staffing level and uh, that uh, the amount of, the, that their funding barely supports the minimal staffing level allows for response, uh, which is to have uh, two vehicles available uh, in a serious situation, because a lot of times you don't want to send one out there that can be more dangerous for everyone involved than sending two vehicles out. Uh, so these are tough issues. And uh, I just don't want to do anything that communicates to the town manager that he doesn't have to look at the totality. Uh, so I'm okay with leaving the sentence in, but that's why I've been expressing the hesitation that I have. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, I can't you know, say. Andy, yeah. Andy, I've been reading the sentence over and over and over again and, and uh, thinking about uh, Wait a second. I'm sorry, I had trouble with my laptop. Um, I've been reading the sentence over and over again and thinking about the symbolic nature. I think this is a cop out and the sentence should be removed. I think that you and Bernie are more on track um, about it. Can I? Uh, yep, Lynn. Um, one of the things that this is a very complex issue, and we all have recognized that there is a group of people in Amherst who believe that the way to get the money that would be 
available for other services is to defund the police. There are other people in Amherst that don't see that as the way to do this. Um, so one of the issues that is not clear yet is what we've agreed we need to have in Amherst. And that's what the Community Safety Working Group is in, is working on, is, you know, do we need um, social workers, additional health care workers, what do we, you know, um, whatever we may need. What I think happens with a budget process is it's then up to the town manager to figure out how to get that to happen. And that may not be by cutting police. And I, I know that's not what the defund 413 people want to hear. But one of the things that has been out there in and, in and among all of the messages is they want these additional, more, if you will, humane ways of working with people like homeless, uh, mentally ill, domestic abuse. Ultimately, that's why they want, and, and they feel that somehow or another, it should come out of the police budget. But in many ways, what you really say to a town manager is, you've got this group, they're gonna come forward with recommendations. If, if we, quote, the town council believe that those recommendations are good and solid, then you town manager, go find out and figure out how to fund it. Mm -hmm. And what this sentence does, it's symbolic, it, it echoes what we did, but it basically says, we think you should go to the police department. And I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that level of detail. And now yeah. moving more towards where Bernie and Andy have been. And since I've been sitting in the middle all along on this. <laughs> I agree with Lynn and Andy and Bernie. I, you know, I really think that the community safety working group has got to craft, they've got to craft a solution and then we've got to figure out how to, or Paul <laughs> needs to figure out how to fund it and the council needs to provide some guidance around that. And that's, again, that's my fear that if we, we anchor on these two positions, we're going to inhibit a genuine creative solution to what people have identified as challenges for Amherst. And let me just go further. And if we think that single solution is how we're going to get at racial equity and social justice, then we're really naive. Yep. We are not <laughs> solve the problem. It's only a very, very small piece of the issue. Pat, so, uh, me. So, uh, the only other one who's spoken heavily on this is Kathy. Uh, do you have any last thoughts before we were delete this? She deletes a sentence. You're muted. You do, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm muttering. So you probably don't want to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> but I'm clearly being outvoted on this. Um, I do think it's a shame not to cross reference that we took an action earlier. If um, the wording on this is not the right way to do it, um, I can understand that. Um, I never thought, you know, I, when I started on police, I was literally saying, reduce it by two slots. I am, um, I was comparing to other places in the world and the way police are trained, thinking we do have a lot of police in Amherst, especially when I add the UMass police to it. Um, and the training, not to any pro of police officers, the, but the police academies have not been brought up and they will admit on mental health and the kinds of issues they're dealing with. So I was serious about this, but if everyone is saying that it's, it appears that two positions alone could solve it, or the police department budget is the only place to look. That is, was not my intention. Um, I just want to not ignore that we had somewhat of a discussion last time and we're starting to look at other towns that don't use just police for, for some of these efforts. Um, so that, that it, I have a real discomfort on 
moving, removing all this wording, um, but I'm not going to stick by this. I just think it's a mistake not to reference the fact that we, I always thought it was a path forward. It was a beginning, um, not an end. Um, and that we weren't silent last time. And I know there's a perception that we were silent um, and I don't think we were silent. So, you know, this may not be the right wording for it, particularly if it's read as, if we just took these two positions, we could uh, do a whole bunch of wonderful things with it. Um, that wasn't the intention. Um, so I'm willing to give it up. I didn't write it. <laughs> One possibility is to leave it into the moment and then Andy does the rewrite, think more about it and a way to refer to the pastor framework. Yeah. Dorothy has her hand up. Um, I think that's a good suggestion, Lynn. Um, I just think not to include that this action was taken, discussed, and voted on by the council um, makes the document incomplete. Uh, certainly, to have to, we do, I'm not suggesting it be presented as the solution, but it was an action that was taken in good faith. Uh, so I think it should be in in some form, just so that when you read it, you can remember what we did and what we said. And I, I would be totally- uh, 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 Kathy, it's not your turn. Okay. <laughs> you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. And I've been waiting. <laughs> yeah. You did raise your hand, Pat. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> One of the things that's true is we've taken many actions around the budget this year. If we're going to reference this one, we need to reference all the others. And I don't think that's the position. I would love to have people come away and pat me on the back um, and say, oh, good job. You're trying to keep the uh, positions frozen. I'm trying to change policing in Amherst. And that feels real different to me. And I think the emphasis needs to be on this working group of BIPOC people who we have entrusted with this action. Um, so I do think it's an inappropriate to have this sentence. Whatever the cost for me is politically, I don't care, but I care about this document. Dorothy still has her hand up. Dorothy. I'm taking it down. I, I couldn't follow the reasoning on that, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I think there's no point in arguing anymore. I thought Lynn's suggestion was good. Keep it in and let Andy edit it. I'm not sure that in the end, uh, mentioning the police department is, is a specificity. Uh, well, well, why don't you leave it into your writing now so we have the wording present. Uh, and I will give it some consideration and send another draft to y'all anyway. Okay. Um, let's see what I, if I can come up with anything else, because I think that the, the key thing that we really keep coming back to is we want his, the, the working group uh, do its job yeah. recommendations right. to be considered and that. Mm -hmm all possible uh, that, re that flexibility be retained mm -hmm. the budget development process to allow uh, their work to be reflected. If that means continuing the freeze on two positions, that's where it gets to. So Shall we go on and see if there's any comments that people have about capital or anything, uh, what's been written about capital now? to raise. Kathy? I, I just um, I just have a question if sh I'm assuming Sean is still hanging in there with us. Um, I think this is really well worded. Um, my question is, 
um, do we do we want to raise do we want to be stronger on we don't think we're going to get back to 10 percent or is it too soon to be able to say that I know I, I know Sonia has a view on that um, you know so that we're we're making an effort to get it back up to eight um, do we think you know, over the next two or three years, we might be able to get back up to 10, or is it unlikely that we're going to back? So this, and I'm just looking again for sig singling, signaling here, and I want it to be totally accurate. So if we're not ready to, um, but everything has become tougher because of this. Um, so, uh, so that, that was my only, you know, we're, we're, we're going, we're, we're, trying to hold the line at at least do 8% this year. Um, what we just said about the new normal, if if our local receipts and revenues don't come back up, um, uh, it doesn't look to me like we're going to get back up to 9, 10 uh, in the next couple of years. So it's a question, Andy. I, I don't want to write that sentence. Well, I'll look to see if... Uh... Sean raises his hand and, uh, to respond. In the meantime, I'll call him Bob. Yeah, I, I just, I, maybe I missed it, um, but should we in this section just mention the, the inventory that will help with capital planning mm -hmm. needs? Uh, let's see if Sean has any comments on that too. Sean? Yeah, so um, to Kathy's, point. Um, it's a really high priority for me to get back to 10%. I know it, it, we can't guarantee it and it might be difficult, um, but I think our aim should be to get back to 10% as quickly as possible, um, given our needs for the four major building projects and how important, you know, 10% is to making that happen. So I would, you know, keep whatever language in there about really making that a, a strong, um, a strong push by us to get there. Um, in terms of the inventory, I don't, you know, I think it's fine. I think, you know, we fully intend on doing the inventory um, and we're going to discuss it, I think, after this time permitting. So, you know, I, I don't have any reservations about the inventory being in there, but it, it's a charter requirement. So we fully plan on moving forward with it. Um, I guess, I guess to your point, Bob, I don't know, Andy, if there's a difference between the second conversation we're going to have where you make a recommendation to the council about adopting inventory, um, you know, an inventory plan for this year versus it being in the budget guidelines. I don't know, you know, if it would be redundant if it's in two places or not. Yeah, I don't know that it adds too much unless you're, uh, unless the inventory makes a big difference to the development of a budget. Uh, I mean, I could see something along the lines of, you know, consider the inventory when developing the capital improvement program or um, something along those lines that would, you know, would make logical sense. Okay, let me look to see if I can get that in. Yeah, I, the, my point was just to acknowledge the inventory that, you know, it's a, it's an effort I think will be very valuable and it'll be helpful in looking at capital budgets, right? I mean, that's okay. all. Okay, let me see if I can get a sentence in along those lines. And uh, the other thing is to make see if we can get I can get in something about that we feel it's important that we get back to 10% as soon as possible or uh, something like that. I think that the one thing that I was a little hesitant towards is the exact wording. If revenue projections increase over the next months, we encourage you to consider increasing the percentage of the levy dedicated to capital. We just uh, also recognize that their social justice needs, which may be more difficult to meet than are otherwise thought. And um, that we also don't want to see the schools cut, um, particularly it wasn't our idea to uh, it came out of uh, other discussions at the four town meeting, really, where that arose. Uh, so I, I, I 
guess I would uh, be cautious because we're putting a lot of, as, as there always is, if there's any additional money, uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on it. Kathy? Yeah, I, um, Andy, you just flagged that sentence. And as I hear you talking, I think we should just remove it. You know, that 8% is a good target, um, but not, um, we may well need that money for the new initiatives, for the schools, for other things, not, not have a strong, everything goes into capital. So if you just remove it, it's neutral, I think. I, I actually disagree. Okay. And the reason I disagree goes back all the way to that sentence where we can't keep pushing these projects down the road. All right. I think that the other thing you could do is instead of saying what's here is the other version that I had just prepared it out a little bit that uh, getting to back to the 10% goal as soon as possible is a, uh, an important step for the community or something like that. Right, I'm not... I'll lower my hand. I, I don't feel strongly about deleting it, but it does send a strong preference signal given what we know um, we just said up above. So, yeah. There are, there are going to be no really good choices here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> You are saying easy choices. We got to page seven and we finally just said that. <laughs> <laughs> there are not going to be any easy choices here. Okay, anything else? Uh, Dorothy has her hand raised. Dorothy on the Capitol. Yes, I think we should never forget that many aspects of our capital projects are related to social justice, right. school, oh, give me library renovation. Um, well, I feel very strongly they are. Yeah. Uh, and if we're going to build any of them, we have to be very strict with our finances. Because right now we don't have a clear path to do it. We don't have one. I'm hoping to figure one out. Okay. Uh, in the last section of the document talks about other budget needs and to, just makes reference to uh, the policies on OPEB, for example, in retirement. And uh, then The budget process section um, where we're getting to there is that it includes um, asking that certain things be considered in the budget doc as he develops a budget document or otherwise reported. And that's because the budget document is actually not our document. And uh, so I wanted to be not too, not directive in it, but just say that this is information that we think would be useful. And then that was what I was trying to convey. Yeah, I think, I, I'm glad you, it says or otherwise. I, I actually have to say, I laughed when I read twice weekly in May. I'm going meeting well into June last year. Well, we're on a different schedule this year. Yeah, we're, we're quote back to normal. With luck. We're counting on it. I think that last year was the everybody was taken by surprise. You have to remember that when that hit. So um are we all comfortable with the draft as, uh, as we've discussed it? And what I will do is uh, there's one paragraph that I was gonna work on with, 
Lynn and generally try and do some others and then see if I can get a uh, draft um, four uh, out to you quickly and invite individual comments from members of the committee uh, without reply to all, which I will remind you of many, many times. And uh, then we'll uh, see if we can, uh, from there, just go ahead and send it to the council in that form. And I don't know, I don't, I mean, somebody could make that a motion to make that what a, a firm statement or a policy. I don't think it's necessary, but because uh, we, but if somebody offers a motion, certainly we'll consider it. I have a plan. I move that we, um, after review of the next round of drafts, agree that to forward the budget guidelines to the town council and recommend their approval. Second. DeAngelis. Okay. Uh, before I uh, call for a vote of the committee, um, actually what I think I'm going to do is just go ahead through all of the committee and I'm going to call on uh, both of our resident members and then uh, with the understanding that when I'm calling on them that they are going to uh, state an opinion if they so wish as to whether they support this, uh, but that it's not required um, under the rules and it's not counted as part of the vote. Um, I've got to go and see if this bear is really on my porch. I'll be back. <laughs> That's a loaded statement if I've ever heard one. <laughs> Yeah, I just had to run upstairs to get the, the plug the power supply in for my laptop because it was running out of juice. I didn't have a bear. <laughs> but, but Bernie, when I saw the empty waterfall and you're not there, my first unconscious thought was, <laughs> did he drown? That was slipping, yes. Oh, um, let's, let's go for the vote. Dorothy? Yes. Um, Lynn? Yes. But you were Bob, gonna... Bob and Bernie. I support it. Okay. Um, I support it. And I'll say that I support it too, Kathy. Yes. Bernie. Bernie says yes. yes. Uh, I say I yes. Okay, so I will um, report this as a unanimous vote and with um, indications, um, statements of support from the two resident members present. Um, Lynn, would, so that we can move this along, could you put up that memo from uh, Sean about the in, in the, about the inventory? And, hey, um, uh, just one, one suggestion, can you send the, the, the next draft out with track changes so we can see what the changes are? It'll make it easier to review it quickly. Yes. Yes, thank you. I will send Great. it to Andy and then you send it on. Okay, and then because uh, we want to make sure that we have that one section right. This is the draft and, um, memo. Is that right? It was, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was attached to his email. I got it. Yep. Yep. Okay, so uh, when, when Sean followed our last conversation about this and then he put together this recommendation forwarded to me, I uh, was pleased with what he came up with uh, and uh, as an initial goal for the first year is something that was both providing useful information and was doable. Um, so I, uh, I 
you know, must note that if you don't feel that you've had enough time with it, um, unlike the um, guidelines draft, we could put it off a meeting. Um, I worded it carefully last night to the council. Oh, it was at 11.30 at night and most people were probably not listening that closely. You admit it? <laughs> I said we, I, I think what I said last night was we uh, might have two items. Um, you can put it on the meeting, on the agenda on the 21st, but I will tell you that if uh, of the two agenda items coming for finance guideline, guidance, budget guidance will take the precedent. And if we have to move this to the 4th of January, we will. Is there any comments on it? We got hands up from Bob, Kathy, Sean, Dorothy. Okay, yeah, I, I lost my participant list again, so let me get back to that. Uh, Kathy, going back in order. Okay, I, I thought this was great. I thought it was a really good start. And Lynn, if there is any way to get people to at least, you know, passively say yes to it, one of the things that would be really, I think was a goal, that Sean would be able to bring the first draft of this to JCPC, which would start meeting in February. So, you know, having it as a background document um, as we're looking at, you know, the, the capital request, you know, whether it's right at, on day one, Sean, or, you know, by the beginning of March. So uh, looking at it early January, I, I know you were starting to work on this anyway. So, um, but, but I really liked it. And I liked the, the bottom part that said, um, the purposes of it, you know, how, how we think we're going to be able to use it and what we might be able to add in the future. So I think if you say this is doable, it's great. Um, I particularly, the second part, the one, two, three, four, the fourth, empty buildings or, um, you know, buildings we're not currently using. Um, I, I think even if the inventory just yellow shades them or something so that it puts on our radar screen the fact that we own some public land and properties that potentially might be useful in grand planning schemes when we're thinking about all of our resources. So I liked it, yeah. Well, can I actually, Kathy, you just jogged my memory on something. On the buildings area, if it is an empty building or maybe even if it's an occupied building, can you include the acreage of the right. park? I was, my mind was there. Yep. 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 John? Uh, and S Sean will respond to that. So, Sean, you had your hand up too, and uh, there was just that question to us about acreage. Uh, I, so, I missed um, part of what Lynn said. Did she say include the acreage for? Yeah. Uh, to the extent possible for each of our buildings, especially those that are empty or may become empty, could you include the estimated acreage? So, so the the, the lot size, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can try to do that. I mean, I mean, that wasn't one of the things I don't think we talked about during our discussions, but I can work with facilities to see if that's something they have readily available. Um, okay. That would, you know, just that would be great because you know. What's the quite for what is so the purpose of that would be for um, what? Well, people, when we were looking for sites for the fire station, we okay. need to know how big the lot was. Yeah, I guess the, the I don't know, and I don't know enough about this. You know, just having a bridge does that actually allow you to know like how much is buildable, not buildable, um, or not? That's another issue. Can I, can I just build on what Lynn said though, Sean, if you can get it, uh, things like the Hitchcock Center, the old one that's closed down, I don't know whether they have a very small lot size or whether it goes all the way out to the road and backwards. I, I have no idea because um, the common school sitting right there in the farm. So if it, you know, you get a different sense of alternative uses. Um, sure. 
um, yeah. if you no. know small versus big. Yeah. That might be, I mean, with GIS and stuff like that, it might be something that's already, um, you know, that's easily something we can pull. Um, so my comments were just to reiterate, if possible, it would be nice to have this approved as soon as possible, at least the, you know, sort of this a preliminary um, list, because I'd like to try to have, you know, on or about January 1st be the date we pull the mileage information. And that'll have implications for the second year if we want to try to have consistent chunks of time when we pull this information to see, you know, usage and, um, you know, just how, how often something is used in terms of mileage. We want to have sort of consistent data grab dates. And so I'd like to get, if possible, again, January, around January 1st to be that date that I can let department heads know to go pull that information, um, mostly for the vehicle side of this. Um, so again, if it is possible, you know, if there's, if, again, we can add things like acreage, we can try to do that if it's available, um, but that would be my one push. Bob Hegner, Bernie and Dorothy all still have their hands up. I said, um, yeah, yeah Bob, I, I was, uh, I was just going to say that, you know, I, 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 I think this is great, a good start. I can, we can noodle this forever, but I, I agree with Sean. It's time to kind of let it go and let Sean get working on it. And then we can see, you know, if we want to change it in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dorothy. Okay. Uh, again, I agree. It's really great. And I suggest the wording to do with the building would be lot size, lot size and building coverage. Uh, I had some questions on the vehicles. Um, I didn't quite understand what you meant. We'll include two years in the second year. I know that means something, but I just couldn't figure out what it meant. So it, it just means that um, I think there were part of the requests were, um, to see how many miles a, a vehicle is used um, during the year. And so we don't really have a consistent point in time where we can grab that information. So the first year we'll grab it at a certain point in time and then we'll grab it at that same point in time the second year. So the next time we do the inventory, you'll be able to see how many miles that vehicle was used over the past year. Okay, and then the only other thing I, <laughs> Sorry, that, I, that I had to add was, um, you have a lot of very good questions on the cars. Um, to me, a question that's of value, but maybe not to you, is, is this a, a vehicle which has many drivers or one or a few drivers? Because that makes a big difference in the, in the car's longevity. That's, that's too hard. Yeah, I think, the, I think the frequency of use was what we were trying to get. I mean, I don't know if we'll know. I would assume most vehicles have many drivers, just in general. Um, or could have many drivers at different points in time during the year, but um, the frequency of use, we were trying to give you a sense of, you know, is it used a lot, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bernie? Yeah, I just, um, thanks for, for, for taking the sign, Sean. This is gonna be valuable uh, in a number of ways. I just wanna point out that most, that all the stuff that's in the building section should be able, you should be able to pull that from the assessor's records. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you may find that some of the buildings aren't insured or that there's a discrepancy between the insured value and the assessor's uh, value of the building, depending on how the insurance company, uh, when and how the insurance company um, determines the amount. My experience is they use a formula. Uh, the, the assessors are probably a little bit more accurate, who knows. But, but again, pulling the assessor's records could give you those. And I'd really wanna caution people not to add too much to this because uh, um, you, people can pull this information, slice and dice it later. The important thing is to get it down and get it get it started. Let's go. Uh, uh, Dorothy still has her hand up. Oh, just a, a, a question. I know it makes sense to, to have each car have its anniversary year, but wouldn't it be better to have one crazy year, but to say on January 1st, we do the mileage on all the cars? That's what, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. That's what he was proposing. Okay. Great, I agree. So that was that was the proposal. We recommend this to the town council. Is that a motion? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So, um, there's motion on the floor, and it's been made and seconded. I will uh, 
go ahead and uh, do what I did last time and again indicate that uh, anybody uh, that the resident members will be called on as I go through this. Um, so, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Um, Ruthie Pam. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Hey. Bernie Kubiak. Agree. Yes. Lynn Griesmer. Yes. And I agree. And Bob Hegner. I support it. <clears throat> okay. So it's uh, a unanimous vote again with support from both of the resident members. Um, <clears throat> if you want to go back to the uh, agenda if you can, because I think we're almost done then. And uh, if he does this, I had mentioned it early on as um, if I wanted to get it on the record and in, into the minutes. Um, there was a request last night at the council meeting that um, the finance committee um, consider the revenue that is coming in from uh, the marijuana dispensaries and uh, how that is being, um, what's anticipated budgeted and the uses anticipated for that. And uh, I um, just wanted to let you know that uh, we don't, it's not an immediate issue. I have posed some questions to the town manager and the finance director uh, regarding the issue to help us uh, jumpstart the conversation. And I'm looking for um, their uh, input into the discussion as it goes forward. Um, I think that the specific question was whether it was just funds that were going to be going into the general budget or whether there were special uses for them. So um, I don't have any, I don't, it was, I don't really want to discuss it, even though we could, is an unanticipated matter, but we just don't have time. Uh, but if there are any questions about it and any comments, I certainly would recognize hands and uh, otherwise I'm going to go on. Uh, Kathy. Um, I'd like to have it be on the agenda for the next meeting. And I know we have to talk about when the next meeting is. And I'd like a really short memo that starts with about how much revenue we're we talking about and how much of it is an impact part that's impact versus other. So we know the two parts. Um, and with the, where we're restricted, just identify what the restrictions are. So you started to talk about earlier that it's got to be marijuana related in some way, such as the police department um, or a, a training, something for the school. So I would just want not a long one. So we just have a document in front of us. Um, and if it had a footnote or a hot link to something else I can read, because otherwise I'm going to have to go off and learn this by myself. Um, so just a reader's guide to what's on our table would be great. The um, amounts were reported and discussed when we discussed the year end report and fourth quarter report for the last fiscal year. Um, and so that uh, some of the information about the amount that we'd received what we anticipate going forward is kind of an unknown, the effect of uh, uh, the fact that so many students were gone for such a substantial period of time and how that has affected sales is also uh, unclear. Uh, I did the kinds of questions that I was asking in my email earlier today were things like, and I don't have the list in front of me, but uh, whether the Department of Revenue, Division of, Division of Local Services has any guidance whether we have any guidance from our audit firm, Lance and Heath, um, whether we have um, any guidance from the Massachusetts Municipal Association or recommendations from other communities. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I had thought about would be helpful in getting the discussion as to what's being used and what can be used. And yep. uh, so I just, to, uh, I have, um, already sent that request away 
because I re recognize that this is a complicated topic and we need to know what other communities are doing and what some of the professionals that we have to deal with are talking about. So Kathy, did you have anything else? No, no that's just what I was saying, Andy, just gathering that kind of information and putting in a document. I know I can go back and look and I have a vague memory, but I'm not gonna say the number that I saw in the last document on marijuana because Sonia started to break it out. But I just, that we have the discussion when we have enough information so we know, know what we're talking about rather than then generate all the, so if you get, you, you had a really good list of questions just then. Um, and if we have some answers on that, getting back to us and putting it on the agenda makes sense to me. Yeah, so I think that what we could do, uh, if there's no other comments or questions on that one unanticipated item is, um, I have to ask Sean the next question. Item four is off the agenda because no recommendation was coming forward. Do we know when um, a request to consider something might come to the committee? So um, not at this time. So I, I would say there's nothing to do with it right now, um, but I'll let you know as soon as I know if, if there's something that needs to come back. Okay. It has to, it'll be something that goes to the council first. So it'll, cause it'll have to be referred to the committee. So. It usually gets referred to uh, finance in, in the past CRC, but I could see town services being involved this year. So the real issue is instead of making people make multiple presentations, at some point, do we have a committee of the whole where all of the committees involved are try to be at the same meeting? We did that last year with CRC and finance meeting together in one meeting and then breaking into two meetings after uh, the presentations. Right. Problem is that this year, the CPA funds are really, some, some of them are right now recommended being going for town buildings and some are for other things that are community-based and both have financial implications. And yeah, but then we are getting to a committee of the whole council just about. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we also have to deal with the question as to uh, where we have crossover members, because if you break in the, it worked last year, because when it happened, there was nobody who was serving both on CRC and the finance committee. But when we get into TSO, that's not. Uh, CRC have serious overlap. So I think that that's. Uh, something we'll have to figure out later, um, which then gets us down to the meeting schedule so that we can uh, conclude. Um, and uh, since there's no, the public is now departed and I gave one public comment opportunity, but now there's nobody to come back with anything else. So um, meeting schedule, the, um, what we had said to the council was that if they don't adopt the guidelines on the 21st and want to refer it back to the committee for either further drafting or for further consideration that we would have a meeting on the day after, which is the December 22nd. But this committee uh, has sort of expressed a feeling that that was getting fairly close to um, a major holiday and uh, that we wouldn't do it unless absolutely necessary. And so we would hold it, but that's where we were. We also had a meeting therefore scheduled for uh, the 15th. And I'm gonna uh, recognize Dorothy uh, who's going to explain uh, her hesitation of having a meeting on the 15th. Um, but that would be where we would have an opportunity and I'm not sure that we could really come back to the marijuana thing that quickly anyway on the 15th, but Dorothy, um, you want to express the conflict? Well, I don't have it written out in front of me, but it's a CRC meeting at two o'clock at the exact same time. And it has invited a huge number of other committees, um, planning board, zoning board of appeals. Um, I think, Kathy, doesn't it, isn't CB, CG, what, 
whatever the, the block grant isn't that committee invited to and the housing trust yeah it's it's on the larger zoning housing set of issues yeah yeah so it was just a, a really major meeting i'm not part of it but i i, I attend because i i find it very important so the request was that we uh not have a meeting that date and uh We're going to have to have a meeting. If we have anything that we need to get done by the 4th, mm -hmm. we're going to have a meeting on the 22nd. Or it could be on the Why 15th, we... but a different time. It could be 12 to 2, or it could be 4 to 6. I'm just pulling them out of my hat, but um, they're both set to start at 2. I can do 12 to 2. But uh, um, can, I, can I just ask next? Are we talking about the 15th? The council won't have met. So we, we're not gonna get the guidelines back until the council meets on the 21st. So the topic so we for the- them, We may not get them back at all. I may just adopt them. Right, so it's not clear to me what would be on the agenda on the 15th. I'm totally willing to switch to a different time, but it's just not clear to me what would need to be on that agenda. And if we won't have answers back on marijuana, yet um and we need to meet on the 22nd we'll have time to also address that so i'm just asking what's the topic for the 15th yeah so my suggestion is the that we skip that we not have the meeting on the 15th that we keep the 22nd as a tentative meeting until and recognizing that we may not know until after the council meeting whether it's necessary that we'll attempt not to do it unless it's absolutely necessary that there's something that has, requires action and recommendation for the meeting on the 4th. And otherwise that we agree that the next meeting be on January 5th at two o'clock and that we will attempt to see if we can get the marijuana discussion and uh, move forward from there. Is that an acceptable plan? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, hearing no objections and seeing no hands raised, um, the objections. Is there anything else that people would like to raise as unanticipated business? I yep. just want people to know that we're interviewing for the additional candidate for FinCom at GOL at 10.30 next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but 10.30. And that will be a posted meeting and so that people, um, all of you can attend the meeting. Lynn, I thought it was, I thought the interviews were on the 16th. They are. Yeah, okay. I thought you said something else, I'm sorry. Yeah, so they are on the 16th, Kathy? And Andy, just on the um, meeting on January 4th, in advance of that meeting or during that meeting, could you give us a rough sense of, will we be meeting on the 19th? You know, will there be two meetings in January? Just some sense of January and February. I block them on my calendar. So it's useful me for me to know it. So I don't need to know it now. I'm just saying, you know, to, is it a kind of an every two week schedule or not? Um, and Sean will at some point tell me when JCPC will begin to meet. <laughs> but, you know, just, so that's my only request. So. Yeah, we will read, we are gonna go into a period now <coughs> where we don't need to have quite as frequent of meetings because once the guidelines are done the budget kind of goes off over, over to the uh, executive side and we don't have anything to do on the budget and we just need to see what else we need to move on. On the other hand, um, uh, there are some things that are coming up and I have to get dates from uh, Sean and Sonia about them. For example, the actuary for the OPEB who's look, um, going through and what they do is they, look at the current population of retirees and other information about health insurance projection costs and they redo the um, 
uh, analysis of the amount of our ROPEB liability. And uh, that will generate a meeting probably with the OPEB actuary. Um, and we have to figure out when that gets scheduled. Um, at some point, we will also, and I don't know, Sean, if you have any idea of, or have heard from Sonia about when uh, Melanson Heath will be uh, finishing up an FY20 audit and get in, we will have to meet with Melanson Heath. I would think it's pretty close. So I would say that would be a good, good topics for um, maybe sometime in January. So I think that those are the things that are coming up, but until we have uh, indications of uh, the completion of those documents and can work ourselves into the schedules of the professionals at the actuary and the uh, audit firm uh, and make them coincide with our regular meeting dates, we're, uh, I can't give you a prediction with certainty, Kathy. Yeah, I wasn't asking for certainty, you know, and I know the other one was to bring back um, at some point, bring back the um, Sean's magic modeling tool on the four big projects to have that conversation. So I just, it was uh, by January 4th, if we got some rough sense that two meetings in January or two in February, uh, just, um, and if you don't have it, then fine. I, I'm just yeah. saying, to, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, we'll uh, work on that, but that's it. Anything else from the committee? Because if not, I think we're ready to declare mm -hmm. the event. And right. uh, appreciate how long people stuck with it today, but we did a lot. Yeah. That we can be proud of the draft that we're going to be sending. Bye, everyone. All right, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Lindsay, thank you.